All righty, looks like we're, we're getting started. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sydney Shutro and I'm a member of the Tennessee Fall Prevention Coalition. On behalf of all of the coalition members across the state, we want to welcome you to the first session in the Tennessee Fall Prevention Coalition's virtual program demonstration series for the National Fall Prevention Awareness Week. Governor Lee has also made a formal proclamation. Ooh, if I could talk, it would really help. Um, recognizing September 20th to the 21st uh, as Fall Prevention Awareness Week in Tennessee. The series would not be made possible uh, without our amazing coalition members who helped develop the data collection surveys, volunteers to uh, speak during the series, and truly work every day and strive to educate, promote, and provide programs across Tennessee to help reduce the occurrence of falls in older adults. Thank you all, truly, from the bottom of our hearts. For the audience, this session is being recorded and you have all been placed on mute or are going to be placed on mute um, to reduce the background noise and respect uh, for our presenters. If you have any questions or comments to share, we encourage you to do so using the chat box feature and we'll address questions at the end of the presentation. We have a wonderful presentation for you today that will discuss stopping elderly accidents, deaths, and injuries, or more commonly referred to as the study program. There may be a part of the presentation where the speakers will ask you to join them in performing some exercises. So we encourage you all to participate, but we wanna make sure that you do so safely. Please be sure you're wearing closed toed athletic shoes, have a, the area around you clear of any objects that may be a tripping hazard or a falling hazard, um, have some water handy. And if you ever need to take a break, please feel free to do so at any time. Without further ado, I want to turn it over to Karen Uzel Baggett, who will tell us about herself, be leading the discussion today, and, her, and introducing us to some of her friends who she's invited to share their knowledge and expertise. So, Karen, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Sydney. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, can you see my um, first slide? Yes, we can. Okay, well, first off, like Sydney, I want to begin with a thank you for your participation. Um, I really appreciate everyone registering for the event. During the registration process, you might have seen that this, uh, instead of just providing your name and your email, you also needed to provide additional information, such as uh, things about yourself, if you have a fear of falling, things about your environment, and so on. That information is crucial in terms of helping us gather data, which we can then use for the betterment of all Tennessee citizens. Specifically, your data will help us obtain grants from sources like the Administration for Community Living, Housing, Urban Development, and so on, because we want everyone to be able to stay independent as they go through life. Also, Sydney made reference to a proclamation signed by the governor. For the benefit of everyone in the audience, especially those joining us by phone, I'd like to read this proclamation, which you see here. The state of Tennessee, proclamation by the governor. Whereas citizens of the state of Tennessee share a desire to raise awareness and encourage the prevention of falls and injuries among older adults. And whereas older adult falls are increasing and sadly often herald the end of independence. And whereas with more than 10,000 older Americans turning 65 each day, the number of fall related injuries and deaths are expected to surge, resulting in cost increases unless preventative measures are taken. And whereas in 2019, nearly 700 older Tennesseans died as a result of falls, which is nearly two people a day. And whereas in 2019, over 63,000 older Tennesseans visited emergency departments as a result of falls, which is 173 people a day. And whereas the financial burden on older adults 
as a result of falls in Tennessee is $885 million. And whereas older adults and disabled individuals can prevent falls by talking to their doctor to evaluate their fall risk, reviewing all medications that cause loss of balance, engaging in strength and balance exercises, undergoing a routine vision check and making their homes safer, and whereas falls are a growing public health issue and fall prevention awareness promotes evidence-based prevention programs and strategies to reduce the staggering number of falls deaths in older adults each year. Now, therefore, I, Bill Lee, governor of the state of Tennessee, do hereby proclaim the week of September 20 to September 24, 2021, as Fall Prevention Awareness Week in Tennessee and encourage all citizens to join me in this worthy observance. Just want to do a short reminder. Once again, this session is being recorded. Your continued viewing of this live webinar indicates your consent to participating in this forum. As Sydney indicated, I'm Dr. Karen Ezell Baggett. I'm a licensed occupational therapist with a private practice serving the Nashville, Tennessee and surrounding areas. I'm also a proud member of the Tennessee Fall Prevention Coalition member, uh, Membership Council. And uh, I, I say hello to all the fellow members who are on with the call with me today. I am delighted to be joined by two distinguished ladies. First off, Dr. Mariana Tondo. Dr. Tondo, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so hi everyone, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm Mariana Tondo, I'm a licensed physical therapist. I have experience working on the outset, uh, outpatient setting for 10 years. And I also have my private practice here serving uh, Tennessee. Next, Dr. Jeannie Azell, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, good morning. I've been a pharmacist in um, over 40 years, practiced in Tennessee, Kansas, and Missouri. And I have had medication safety as a very important part of my practice throughout um, my work in hospitals, but doing lots of educational things for people in communities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lays. I'm proud to be joined, uh, uh, joining with you today to present this worthy topic. This is what we'll be discussing. First, it's critical to have an understanding of the impact of falls. Then we'll move on to talking about some fall facts that come from the CDC. And then we'll talk about the risk factors for falls because you need to know those risk factors in order to preserve your independence as you age. And then we'll talk about this study program and critical team members for fall prevention. And finally, conclude with a summary. When you look at the impact of falls, falls rank right in the top 10 causes of death among older adults. Specifically, falls are part of what's called unintended injury. And as you can see, when you look at the, when you break down the subset of unintended injury, which is number seven in terms of the top 10 causes of death, falls are the number one cause of in, unintended injury deaths. And unfortunately, as the population ages, this number of deaths that we see is only going to increase. Specifically, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that every second an older adult falls. This results in 36 million falls. The falls can occur by falls uh, on a single surface, such as a slippery floor, falls from stairs, ladders, on ice, or so on but 36 million falls every second an older adult falls. This results in 8 million injuries, 36 million visits to the emergency department, 950,000 hospitalizations, and regrettably, 32,000 deaths. 
That's why events like Falls Prevention Awareness are critical, and I'm glad that it's a nationwide observance, not only here in Tennessee, but throughout the nation for this week. In terms of facts for falls, it's important to look at the nationwide facts. Nationwide, one in four older adults who are 65 or older fall each year. One out of five of these falls result in some kind of serious injury like head trauma, TBI, or fractures, be it an upper extremity bone or a lower, or more important, a lower extremity bone or even your pelvis. The fall death rates in the United States has increased by 30% when you look at the period 2007 to 2016. For Tennessee, the um, Tennessee um, Department, uh, the Tennessee De Commission on Aging and Disability, specifically Sydney Scutro, who you had the pleasure of meeting um, initially, were able to compile data on falls, and we all need to be aware of what the data says. Overall, there's an initiative called Healthy People 2020, which you may have heard of. This is a CDC initiative where it looks at factors which determine good health. And so they establish goals. As you can see, the Healthy People 2020 goal for falls is 4.7% or fewer in terms of just looking at the emergency room visits. Regrettably, Tennessee is not reaching that goal. For us, the rate is 7.3% of older state residents having to visit the ER due to a fall, so we are well above the desired metric. Next, the total number of ER visits due to falls from 2015 to 2019, as you can see, was 293,376, which is still too large. And then the five-year estimated fall death rate for Tennessee was 5,477 individuals per 100,000. Falls are not a normal factor of aging. And in order to maintain our independence as we get older, it's important to know the risk factors for falls. One of the risk factors is lower body weakness. Do you have the strength in your lower extremities to walk safely from one point to the other? Perform such actions possibly like stepping from side to side, pushing a grocery cart or whatever, walking your dog. All of that factors into lower body weakness and Dr. Tondo will go into more specifics about lower body weakness in just a few minutes. The other factor is vitamin D deficiency. Naturally, as people get older, vitamin C deficiency happens. We lose our ability or we have a reduced ability to absorb vitamin D in the skin and synthesize it, excuse me. And also, we have reduced outdoor activity, so we're not out in the sun so much. And low vitamin C deficiency has been linked through research to high fall risk. The next factor we need to be aware of is trouble walking and maintaining our balance, which goes hand in hand with lower body weakness. And Dr. Tondo will go into more of this in just a few minutes. And we need to be cognizant of the medications we're using, whether they're prescription medications or medications that we're using to kind of treat a, um, a cold or some congestion we have or so on. And Dr. Ezell will have an excellent presentation on the way that medications affect your fall risk. And then vision problems. If you wear glasses like myself, you need to make sure you have a correct prescription. And then everyone needs to make sure they're having an annual eye exam. Vision problems, sometimes related to chronic conditions such as diabetes, can have a slow impact on your vision that you cannot detect 
oftentimes until it's too late. And then of course we know about things like glaucoma, which narrows our peripheral field of vision, cataracts, which clouds our vision, and then age-related macular degeneration, which also negatively impact our vision. And then foot pain and improper footwear. If you're wearing slick, snick, slick uh, slippers around the house, those can create a fall risk, especially when you're going up and down stairs, or if you have your favorite set of shoes and the soles have begun to come apart, all those things can factor in to creating fall risk. And finally, those home hazards, those cords we have going from our cell phone to the couch while we're sitting there looking at our phones, that cord can become a trip hazard, as can having poor lighting in rooms and so on. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about those home hazards in just a few minutes. I'd like to put up, have a polling question put up. And the polling question is, has your doctor or other health professional asked you about your fall history? A is yes, and B is no. Sydney, are we able to put up the question? Yes, I have launched the poll um, and we're getting some responses. We have about 13 people who've responded the, thus far, so we'll give everybody about uh, 10 to 15 more seconds. So okay. sounds great. And so far we're looking at about 33% say yes, 67% say no about okay. of 18 responses. Okay. Let me give you guys just a couple more seconds. Alrighty, so we'll go ahead and close the poll. So we had 21 people respond with 38% saying yes, their doctor uh, has asked about their fall history and 62% said no. Okay, thank you so much. All right, regrettably, we're finding out that this is typical for the subject of falls. And so it are, what we have with our just kind of informal poll aligns with what we find with the results when other researchers do um, polls regarding falls. For one thing, older adults are often hesitant to speak to their healthcare providers about falls and medication risks. They, they may fear that, um, you know, it's not a big deal. Like I said, it's a, just a normal part of aging. Also, they may think that, um, you know, if I tell someone, that I'm falling, then they may want to take away my independence. They may want to send me to a nursing home and I'm not ready for that. Specifically, in the response to the question done by researchers in the past 12 months, who has talked to you about medications that might make you fall? 82% of individuals said no one. So it kind of aligns with what we're seeing from our informal poll. 15% said the doctor which is always good to know. 8% said other healthcare providers, such as pharmacists, and so that's good. And then 3% said family, care, family, a caregiver, or someone else had talked to individuals about falls. So clearly we see that we need to encourage conversations about falls that have occurred, fear of falling, and then discuss fall risk. We're here specifically today to talk about the STEADY program. And STEADY is an acronym for Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths, and Injuries. This is an evidence-based fall program that was recommended by the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And it grew out of studies by the American and British Geriatric Societies. The focus is on community-dwelling adults who are age 65 and older. And the goal is to keep these individuals living in the community and being independent for as long as possible. You should be able to enjoy your golden years where you desire as you get older. The three core elements of study are screen, identify patients at risk for falling. There are several ways to do this. Study has 
a staying independent brochure, which has 12 questions for individuals to answer. Those questions are very similar to some of the questions that you asked that you were asked during registration. So they help provide uh, insight. Also, there are three key questions that study encourages doctors to ask, and we'll get into those in just a few minutes. The other thing is assess. This is where doctors and other health professionals can help assess the individual. They can do things like evaluate gait, strength, and balance. They can review medications. They can measure blood pressure in two positions, one lying down and one standing up to see if there are any changes such as drops in blood pressure. And then finally, they can intervene. It is wonderful when occupational therapists and physical therapists get referrals from doctors so that we can help the individual through either working on strategies to make their, their activities safer or working on strengthening and conditioning programs. But these three things, screen, assess, and intervene are the hallmarks of the study program. This is an algorithm that is given to physicians. As you can see, it takes an individual who is implementing the study program through a series of steps. After doing such things as having the individual complete the stay independent brochure or asking them the three questions, if the individual doesn't appear to have a fall risk, that still lets the doctor know that they need to encourage the individual to keep doing those preventative things. So simple things like making sure you're aware of fall risk, making sure your vitamin D intake um, includes between 800 to 1000 IUs of vitamin D on a consistent basis, and then making sure you're kind of at least investigating community exercise programs that you may find at senior centers, your Y, or so on. And we're going to talk about some of those excellent programs as the week progresses in terms of matter of balance, staying active and independent for life, walking, and so on. They will all be presented. But if the individual is at risk, certainly there are things that they need to do in terms of assessing and intervening. There are some critical team members that factor into fall prevention. And of course, the doctor is one of the main individuals. You want to make sure that you talk to your doctor about falls. Be honest. Don't shield the fact that you've had a fall and discuss any fear of falling. But the three key questions you're looking and hoping that your doctor is going to ask are, have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when standing? Or, and do you worry about falling? Another key member is your pharmacist. And I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Ezel. Thank you. What I would like to do today is share some important medication safety advice and then focus on how you can help reduce your fall risk from medications. So go to the next slide there. Um, there are a few key things that are really important, no matter what your age is or um, what diseases you may have, everyone should carry a list of up to date and complete of all your medications that you take with you. That way, if you are in any kind of an accident, it is readily available. Typically, you want to carry it in your wallet. It may mean you fold it up or put it in a purse, um, but have that list with you. And be sure to include medications that you can purchase without a prescription, such as aspirin, vitamins, nutritional products. And don't forget about other types that you don't take orally, like creams, ointments, inhalers, patches, and eye drops. So make sure that list is complete. When you go for any kind of a medical appointment, you really should always take your list <laughs> containers. Um, and some physicians actually require that if you bring even the bottle so that they can actually see exactly what you're taking. Um, 
And if you go to the hospital, especially if it's planned, be sure you have that list with you and have them handy in case an emergency comes up. If you're going to be transported to a hospital, you want to have that information with you because that's going to be one of the first important things that are asked. And always update that list with every change in your medication. Now, I would like to pose a poll, a poll question. How many medications do you take each day? Select A if it's zero or nine to three, or B if it's four to seven, or C if it's eight or more. Okay, the poll has been launched and we have, uh, we'll give everybody just a few more seconds to respond. We have about 12 responses so far. Keep them coming, everybody. This is how we get everyone's interaction. This is how, you know, if you're distracted by something else, we get you to re-engage in the presentation. We had 21 responses on the first poll. We're up to 20, so we have at least one more person I know who has access. There we go. All righty, so we have 21 responses. 52% um, of respondents said that they take zero to three. Uh, four to seven, uh, 40, oh, we got some more responses, all right. So, sorry. All right, let's see, we're gonna go ahead and close the poll, that way I can actually do the results correctly. 54% uh, uh, say zero to three medications, 42% say four to seven medications, and 4% said eight or more. Okay, thank you, Sydney. The reason I asked this, pose this question is if you're taking four or more medications, and especially if you're over 65, you are going to be potentially at more risk for a fall from that possibly a medication. And obviously, the more medications you take, the more risk you have for interactions and side effects from medications. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. There are medications in certain classes that are more likely to increase your risk for falls. These are medicines that usually cause dizziness. They may cause you to be sleepy or sedated. Um, it may cause your blood pressure to drop when you stand up. It could be blurred vision. It could be confusion. And it might just make you feel groggy. Um, the first class are the anticonvulsants. These are medications used to pre treat and prevent seizures. And sedation is almost always a potential side effect. Some people will not experience all side effects um, or those kind of side effects, but there are lots of different choices in the anticonvulsant class. Some of the older drugs that have been around longer that are very effective may also not be a great choice because they may cause more sedation like phenytoin and carbamazepine. The next group, um, I wanted to mention were antidepressants. These are used to treat depression. And again, there are many options in this class, but there are some that do cause more sedation and potential um, risk for falls in this class, such as fluoxetine or Prozac or Paxil. Um, the next group are antihypertensives, which lower your blood pressure. And a couple of those that stand out that are usually not used in people who are older are clonidine and doxazosin because they will typically have a little bit more fall risk. Antipsychotics is the next class. These are medications that reduce hallucinations, delusions, disordered thinking, and they are sometimes used for other things besides the primary diagnoses of um, schizophrenia and bipolar disease. There are some other potential uses, but usually we don't use these medications in older people because there are so many risks with falls and other adverse effects. And then the last group are antispasmodics or what we might call just skeletal muscle relaxants. These suppress uh, muscle spasms in GI tract and then other parts of the body. And these, um, some of these medications, particularly some of the older ones like methocarbamol and car isoprotol or also called SOMA, those are historically very sedating medications or can cause some confusion. And then the last three groups I'm going to talk about are ones that really should be avoided in older people. Benzodiazepines, which have been around for some time, um, probably know as Valium or Diazepam or Librium, 
or lorazepam or clonazepam. These are usually treated, treating um, anxiety or sometimes used to help with sleep. Um, these can certainly be um, fall risk and often implicated in falls. Opioids, um, we've heard a lot about opioids and there's been a lot more emphasis the last couple of years on trying to reduce our use of opioids because of addiction. Um, these are used to treat pain, hydrocodone, morphine, oxycodone. Um, again, they're, um, they do have those risks, particularly of sedation, anticholinergic effects, which cause the drying effects, can be some confusions, but again, particularly in older people. And then sedative hypnotics um, usually are just used short term to help with bedtime sleep, but they certainly can be very risky in an older adult. And one other I would like to mention that's very can be very sedating is diphenhydramine. You can buy that over the counter without a prescription, um, otherwise known as Benadryl. That is not a very safe medication for older people because of the um, anticholinergic and the sedating effects. Okay, so what can you do about this? If you uh, take any of these medications or if you are taking at least four or more, I recommend you talk to your medication expert and your best resource for medication information and advice, your pharmacist. Um, anytime you get a new medication prescribed, always discuss that with your pharmacist. You wanna know why exactly it's, uh, how it works and why you're taking it. Um, and always ask that of your physician. If they're gonna add some kind of medication to your regimen or that you are gonna take to treat something, be sure you understand that. And especially how to take it and when to take it. Um, and then are there any possible side effects and what could you do to treat those? Or, or when should you report them? Or when should they become a concern? Are there any interactions with any other medications? These are all important things to discuss with your pharmacist with every medication. Then another thing that you can do, uh, many Medicare uh, beneficiaries can benefit from something called a comprehensive medication review a CMR. This is a program that primarily is approved for Medicare beneficiaries to receive at no charge if they have a couple of chronic diseases and take several medications. The pharmacist will sit down with you and go over all your medications and review them, look at ways that they might could be improved, perhaps reduce some of them or um, change if there are some better alternatives. And what they will do is provide you then with a plan on anything you might could do yourself to make sure you take them correctly and consistently. And also things that you might discuss with your physician, especially if there might be a better alternative to consider. So in summary, the next slide, what can you do? What I would suggest um, you do first is schedule a consultation with your pharmacist. Actually make an appointment and say, I'd like to talk to you about my medications, especially if you have any concerns about fall risk or you have fallen in the past. Uh, that pharmacist can then review your medications and help you with a plan that could include medication changes or how you might monitor for potential side effects. And if you are taking a medication that could have or is, is already having some harmful effects, there may be some alternatives that the pharmacist can uh, suggest and that you can then discuss with your uh, physician or your provider who prescribed it. There are times when medications should be considered for reducing the dose. You might still need that medication as you age, but it might be worth reducing your dose because your body typically is going to need less of most medications perhaps as you get older. Um, some medications should be just discontinued and get off of them. And if you were taken off of a benzodiazepine, it is very important to always re have taper that off. And if you have been taking opiates for some time, you would probably also need to taper those and sometimes antidepressants. And then one last thing I think is really important is there can be um, non-medication alternatives might be a good option, especially for symptoms or problems with sleep, pain, and anxiety. There are 
many newer uh, things that have been developed that are safer alternatives that may be um, as effective with a lot less risk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uzel, for your expert advice. Now I'd like to move on and talk about the role that occupational therapists like myself can play as critical members of the fall prevention team. First off, occupational therapists are experts at doing home safety evaluations. Our goal is to ensure that homes are accessible and safe. We look at several areas when we do a home safety eval. First, we're looking at the type of flooring that is there. Do you have carpeted flooring? Is it a high pile carpet, a patterned carpet, or a low pile carpet? Do you have hardwood floors? Are there scatter rugs? We take all of those things into account when making recommendations. The next is stairs and steps. And when we evaluate, we're looking at both interior stairs are they carpeted? Are there items that are stored on the stairs? And so on. But then we're also looking outside at the steps. Do you have, what type of steps do you have? Are they wooden steps? Are there concrete steps? Are there handrails on both sides of the steps for both interior and exterior stairs and steps? We're looking at the kitchen. Are those items that you use most frequently easily within reach? Or do you have to use a step stool to get to your favorite spice or your favorite mixing bowl or so on? And conversely, do you have to squat on the floor and reach way in the back and pull out a heavy pan and then try to lift that onto a counter? So we're looking at things like that in the kitchen. And also is the lighting adequate for you to see if someone something spilled on the floor and then your bathroom we're concerned about that area because that is a slippery area where it can get very humid when you have been running your shower or it, you can have water splashed around so we want to make sure that you're able to use the bathroom safely and we want to make sure you have things like grab bars and then your bedroom we're concerned about things like the height of your mattress. There is a trend now to have big plush mattresses that then sit on mattress pads. This makes the mattress and the mattress pad extremely high and you might fall when you're getting out of the uh, getting out of bed in the morning or in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. And then we're concerned about what is the route that you would travel from your bed to the bathroom if you had to get up at night. Is it well lit and so on? So occupational therapists are experts at giving home safety evaluations and recommendations. The other thing where we can help is helping with those simple things that you do throughout life and you don't think of very much when it, you're feeling at your best, but when you're not feeling well. When you're coming up, when you're having a cold, when if you're recovering from COVID or something like that, or you've had an injury, it can be hard to do those simple things in life. Everything from taking care of your grandchildren, to doing your laundry, to getting dressed in the morning, or even trying to prepare a simple meal for yourself. Occupational therapists can come and work with you on strategies to use energy conservation, adaptive tools and so on for you to preserve your independence at, at doing those things that are important to you. And then finally, we can propose adaptive equipment for you to use in the home and also in the community. And we can make adjustments to those equipment, to that equipment, excuse me. Now, I'd like to move on to another critical member of the fall prevention team. Dr. Tondo, will you please speak to us about physical therapists and the role they play? Yes, absolutely. So what I want to talk about today is three ways to assess uh, gait, strength, and balance. So we have three different tests uh, to assess, 
and see what specific area that we have to work more uh, to uh, prevent fall. So the first test is called uh, timed up and go. And this test, the purpose is to assess mobility and gait. And all you're going to need is a stopwatch and a chair. And the patients can wear their regular full wear and they can use a walking aid if needed. And the patient is going to start sitting on the chair. And then we need to identify a line three meters or 10 feet away from the chair. And always stay close to the patient for safety. So the test works. Uh, we are going to instruct the patient and say, when I say go, I want you to stand up from the chair, walk to the line on the floor at your normal pace, turn, walk back to the chair at your normal pace, and then sit down again. So on the word go, you start timing. And then when the patient sits back down, you stop timing and you record the time. So if an older adult takes 12 seconds or more, he is at risk for falling. And on this test, we can also uh, pay attention to the gait, so how the, the, the person is walking um, to identify any other factors that would be important for the, the treatment plan. Uh, so the second test, uh, we are going to assess balance. Um, so the name of the test is the four stage balance test. And as I said, the goal is to assess the static balance and all you're going to need is a stopwatch. So there are four standing positions that they get progressively harder to maintain. And the patients should not use on this test any assistive device like a cane or walker, and they should keep their eyes open. So you are going to show the patient the four positions, and you're going to instruct them to try to stay at least 10 seconds in each position. So they can hold their arms out or move their body to help keep balance, but they cannot move their feet. When they complete 10 seconds in one position, they're going to move to the next position and so forth. So I have here, next slide please, a picture of the positions. So the first one is the easiest one. You are going to stand with your feet side by side. And then after you've done 10 seconds of that position successfully, we are going to pass to the second position. That is, uh, you place your instep of one foot uh, touching the big toe of the other foot. And then the third position is the tandem stand that you place one foot in front of the other. So the heel is touching the toe. And then the last position that's the hardest is stand on one foot. So if an older adult cannot stay for 10 seconds on the position number three, the tandem stand, he is at increased risk for fall. And you should always stay close to the patient for safety as well, in case they lose their balance. And then our last test is the 30 second chair stand that we are going to be assessing the, the leg strength and endurance. So again, you're going to need a chair with a straight back and ideally down the arms because the patient cannot use their hands to get up off the chair um, and a stopwatch. So the patient is going to sit in the middle of the chair, place their hands on the opposite shoulder, crossing at the wrists, keep the feet flat on the floor, keep the back straight and keep your arms against your chest. And then when the, the, the clinicians say go, the patient rise to a full standing position and then sit back down. And he's going to repeat this movement for 30 seconds. Again, uh, you should stay uh, next to the patient for safety. And you are going to uh, record how many times the patient can complete a full standing position. So here we have a picture of the test and then a table with their uh, different age range and the sex. So if your score is below average for your specific age and sex, you are at risk for falls. So now, actually, I'm going to demonstrate the test. So. I have a chair here, it's not ideal um, because of the armrest, but just disconsider this for uh, demonstration purposes. 
So you're going to keep your uh, arms crossed against your chest. So you should not be using these arms to get up. So you start sitting on the chair, back straight. You sit on the middle of the chair, your feet flat on the floor. You can bend one feet a little bit, one knee a little bit more to give you some stability. And then you're going to get up and raise to a full standing position and then go back and slowly sit down. So here you cannot use your arms and you're going to repeat this position, this movement as many times as you can during the 30 seconds. So again, all these tests, they are important to assess the different parts of the, 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 the prevention of the fall, like the strength, gait, and balance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tondo, for the excellent demonstration and the information. Finally, in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I want to once again stress that falls are not a normal part of aging. Steady and other evidence-based programs like it are designed to help you stay independent. There are several key components of steady. For one thing, older adults, once again, I encourage you to talk with your healthcare providers. Be clear about your fall, falls you've had in the past, your fear of falling and so on, and stay active. We're going to be talking about some excellent evidence-based strength and conditioning programs to help keep you active as you age. And then make your home safer. Reach out to those experts who can help you. And then we know that caregivers, they also play a crucial role. We know that for adults 50 and older, there are 53 million caregivers in the country who are providing care for these for individuals. First off, caregivers, you want to start a conversation with your loved one about their fear of falling. You want to encourage him or her to participate in these exercise programs that you can find at your Y, your senior center, or so on. And the website for the Tennessee uh, Commission on Aging and Disability has excellent access to some of these exercise programs. And then also, you want to make the home safe. So if you've had an assessment, take the advice and make sure you do those recommendations. And finally, our healthcare providers. Steady is designed for you to start the conversation by having the individual complete the staying independence brochure or asking three critical questions at your annual visits. Have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when standing or walking? And finally, do you worry about falling? I encourage you physicians, and all healthcare providers to use the study program. Here are references for the material we touched on today. And now I'd like to find out if there's any questions. Alrighty, thank you ladies. This was extremely educational and informative and we appreciate your time today. We did have a couple questions come in um, and what I'll do is I'll try and uh, Steer it toward uh, a speaker who I think would be able to answer the question. Then, and of course, uh, you all can jump in um, if you have anything additional to add. So, I believe the first question is going to be for Dr. Uzel. Um, what about anti? Oh, I'm sorry, anti cholingering fix. Uh, C H O L I N E R G I C S. What about those medications? Anticholinergic medications. Um, there are some that are in that class that are used primarily to treat um, like adverse effects from antipsychotics, but anticholinergic effects are, are um, a side effect of many medications and probably a couple of them that are the, the strongest that can be, I guess, most dangerous or more put you at risk are when I mentioned Benadryl or diphenhydramine which you can buy without a prescription it's in many antihistamine uh, combinations or sleep medications um, that is one that has some strong anticholinergic effects and it puts you at more risk if you have glaucoma it can make you more confused it has kind of a drying effect 
um, dry mouth, dry eyes, and so forth. So that is uh, certainly um, a risky area for um, if you're taking something that has a strong anticholinergic effect. Good question. Thank you, and thank you for pronouncing that correctly. This is why I'm not a pharmacist. <laughs> Uh, I believe the uh, and Dr. Tondo, Dr. Izel, or Dr. Um, Uzelbaget, any other any input on that question? <laughs> I don't want to leave you all out. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I just want to encourage people to talk to their pharmacist um, if they have any questions about their medication. As you can see, it doesn't happen very often, but you have the right and you should take advantage of that right to ask about your medications and then also make sure you read. Uh, some of the fine print on the medications if you don't have the ability to ask your pharmacist. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Dr. Tondo, I believe this one is going to be geared more toward you. So as we were talking about the, the chair stands, is the chair height ever adjusted to the patient's own height during that test? Yeah, so usually the, the height is the standard, so it's always the same. Uh, but of course, there's common sense. If the patient is too short and needs to adapt the height of the chair, it's adaptable. Uh, but what is important is on the test and then retest, you use the same chair. So you, you are comparing to the same thing to try to measure the progression. And also uh, with the chair height, it's important that the chair is not too high because then it's easier for your legs to do the movement. So we want to test the endurance so the chair can be with the C2 height, it should be, there is this standard height to make sure that you're gonna be using your legs so we can assess your strength on your legs and glutes. And again, if the patient is too short, uh, below average, we can adapt that, but then it's important to keep in mind that you have to do the test and retest with the same chair so you can uh, see the progress. I hope it helps. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we did have one comment come in. Um, I would like to know if this presentation can be emailed to me so we can share the information with all of their coworkers. Um, these ladies have been kind enough to be able to send me a copy of the presentation or will shortly after this, and I'll be able to email it to everyone who's registered, and you can feel free to share that far and wide. We will also have the recording of the presentation um, posted on the Tennessee Commission on Aging and Disabilities YouTube channel this afternoon. So everyone will have plenty of opportunity to uh, view these great resources. And we are getting many thank yous and well done's and excellent presentations from uh, our speakers. We have a, a little bit of time left. I know if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to, to chime in. I have one. Um, I think everything that you all have discussed is extremely important. Um, and I was wondering if each of you can kind of go in individually um, and maybe talk about ways people from across the state might be able to get in contact with occupational therapists, pharmacists, physical therapists to uh, come to their locations and maybe do a presentation. Um, I know you don't know every single OT, PT, and pharmacist across the state uh, by any means, but if you have any uh, resources or, or any input on how someone might be able to get a, a speaker to come to their location, I think that would be great information. Okay, um, I will start um, uh, first off in terms of occupational therapists. Um, I, of course, would love to come to your area in terms of the Middle Tennessee area. I certainly don't mind driving, and um, in previous jobs, I've seen uh, various parts of the state. So um, I certainly, uh, you know, my contact information was available on the first slide. So please uh, send me an email if you're interested in having an in-person or either a virtual presentation. And in terms of those other areas of the state, um, certainly if you would talk to the, in, the occupational therapist working probably in your outpatient therapy clinics, that would be ex um, uh, excellent resources. And, uh, and I only caution about the, the ones in the inpatient um, rehabilitation facilities, they are, I think, probably very busy with everything going on with the pandemic because OTs play a critical role in inpatient care, too, in terms of helping individuals maintain their strength, make sure they're positioned properly to avoid bed sores and things like that. So I think by inpatient occupational therapists, will be uh, pretty busy right now. But uh, occupational therapists working in outpatient settings, hopefully they would be able to provide uh, you with some instructions or some assistance. 
Uh, over to Dr. Tondo. Yeah, so uh, in regards to physical therapy, uh, on the outpatient setting, we see um, a lot of uh, older people that need um, help with balance and uh, prevention of falls that have some trouble walking. So if you reach out to any outpatient uh, PT clinic, you're going to probably find professionals there. Um, also, PTs that are specialized in geriatrics, probably a good um, uh, list to go over. So I think you can probably find this list on the, uh, or maybe on the APTA side, or I can look it up exactly. If you type on Google geriatrics physical therapy, you may be able to find some professionals uh, that probably have uh, more experience specific with that public. Um, and I'm also available um, in Nashville, so all the Middle Tennessee, if anyone um, would like uh, me to go and talk more about the topic, I'll be happy to do that as well. Thank you. Dr. Giselle? Yes, as far as pharmacists, I would suggest if you have a relationship with a pharmacist in your local area to contact that person first and see if they would be willing to come and speak to your group. Um, there, hopefully in most areas, you will find someone who really will enjoy doing that because many pharmacists do that in their local areas. Um, and in the kind of the Knoxville region, I would be happy to speak with your group. Another possible resource is the Tennessee Pharmacists Association. It's based in the Nashville area, but they um, could also be, if you're kind of striking out, finding someone in the local area who is able or has time to do it, then you might try the Tennessee Pharmacy Association because we do lots of uh, presentations all across the state and um, I'm sure they could recommend someone. All right, thank you so much, Sydney, for that question. We appreciate it. Um, yeah. I would just like to remind everyone who's on the call, um, and I will read it for those who are, are on, on Viva Phone. We have a wonderful week of presentations coming up. I'm so excited for this week, and I commend Sydney uh, and her staff on putting together an outstanding week of programming. So thank you very much for joining us for study today. Tomorrow, Tuesday, September 21st, We'll have a presentation on matter of balance. Wednesday, September 22nd, we'll have a presentation on stay active and independent for life. Thursday, September 23rd, a presentation on Tai Chi. And then Friday, September 24th, we'll conclude with a presentation on walk across Tennessee. Excellent. Thank you, ladies. And thank you, Karen, for that. You took the words right out of my mouth and you put it on the screen. So Karen and I think a lot alike and we work really, really well together. Um, but it is 11 o'clock and I want to respect everyone's time. So thank you so much for attending our uh, first session. Um, if you want to hang out with us for a little bit longer, we may have these ladies for about five more minutes or so to answer some additional questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, if you're interested in uh, coming to any of these events that are on the screen, please feel free to register. I know many of you already have, uh, but thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to talking with you the rest of this week. Thank you.